Got it. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Let's just give it a couple minutes as Zoom lets everybody in. All right. I think we got uh, most of the people in so far, and they'll just kind of keep showing up here within the next couple of minutes. So let's get ready to uh, actually kick this off. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join myself, Dr. Phil Cheatham, and Nate Ashton today. We are really, really excited to be able to talk about uh, best practices and also just accuracy when it comes to our sports box data. This is something that is uh, really, really passionate to the three of us. Uh, Nate and Dr. Phil Cheatham spend so much time working on accuracy and making sure that you, the coaches, are being provided with incredible information, and I think everybody's going to be blown away by what we have to share today with you. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Phil Cheatham, and he'll get us started. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. And of course, I want to double check that you can see that and you can hear me and uh, let's go. So as Ryan said, we're going to be talking about accuracy and uh, best practices, basically how to get the best out of your sports box uh, application, how to get the best video captures, how to get the best data. Uh, we'll break it up into three sections or maybe four or five sections, actually, but the three of us will be speaking um and we're kind of doing a tag team thing here i'm going to start off and then i'll hand it over to ryan and then it'll be back to nate and so on so i'm going to start off as i usually do with a bit of um introduction and uh some some theory let me go ahead and go to the next slide um, just a quick little anecdote and a quick little story right at the be beginning here um, I like to call Sportsbox 3D Golf the magic camera. And the reason I do that is because, as, as you know, I've been in, uh, as you may know, I've been in video motion analysis and, and basic motion analysis, 2D and 3D, for many, many years. And way back when I first started as a graduate student in my master's program in the early uh, 1980s, um, we used to sit in the back room and digitize manually. Uh, manually. We used to put the crosshair cursor on each of the joints, wrist, elbow, shoulder, one by one, and then advance to the next frame and to the next frame. And you might do two or 300 frames. So it could take you hours just to analyze one skill, whether it be a gymnastic skill, which was my sport or golf or whatever. And I always wished, I, I thought maybe they someday there'll be a magic camera where you can just point and automatically get data. Um, it only took about 45 years to get there, but it looks like we finally got there. And that's why I'm so excited about Sportsbox 3D Golf, getting 3D accurate 3D biomechanical measurements for every swing, just by literally setting up your um, camera, sorry, your, your iPhone on a tripod and just filming. Um, and now we can stop guessing and uh, start measuring and we can bring this to the average coach or the average golfer, the casual golfer. And that's what's exciting to me. Um, we can make motion anal analysis finally ubiquitous across many different sporting fields. Okay, so how is our technology different to other pose estimation? You might say, well, what the heck is pose estimation? Um, you can see the stick figure on the left there. Pose estimation was invented and artif uh, artificial intelligence and computers got powerful enough to do this sort of thing. Um, basically what the computer does is, is 
figure out where the human is in the video and then figure out where the joints are. Kind of what we were doing manually 40 something years ago. Now it's uh, automatically picking out the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder. But you can see on the left that uh, the original open pose is just a stick figure and it's only 18 points. We've come a long way since then. We've been out for uh, over two years now and um, we do many more points, 35 points. We get three degrees of freedom. What that means is we get the X, Y, and Z. Uh, so we get 3D out of it. We also get what's called six degrees of freedom where we can look at uh, turns and, and linear motion as well. I'll explain that in the next frame. Uh, the next the next uh, slide. Uh, however, the other thing that's very important is we include the golf club. We don't just stop at the wrists and the shoulders here and arms. We actually get the implement as well, which is extremely important. So why is 3D important? And what do we measure? And what is six degrees of freedom? And I'll tell you why it's important as well. So the this th first three degrees of freedom are angular motion around each axis. So you can see on the left here, you've got an axis going through the body, vertically through the body and forward backwards through the body. Uh, you can imagine that these are like handles and as you turn them, the body would rotate around that particular axis. So we've got bend, forward bend, backward bend, left and right or open and closed turn. And then we've got side bend, which is to the lead and the trail side. We also have linear motion, which is measured in, in inches or centimeters, depending on which country you come from. And we've got sway, thrust, and lift. Sway is the side to side motion. Lift is the up and down motion. And thrust is the, the forward backward motion. Um, so these measurements or these um, directions allow us to many measure many different things in the golf swing. And here's an example of some of the sorts of things that we can measure. And by the way, we can also measure from a down the line camera. Typically we measure from a face on camera, but we also have the ability to do down the line, which sometimes at a driving range is easier to do. Um, so you can see the ones we've got, we've got chest turn, pelvis turn, X factor, side bend of the chest and side bend of the pelvis. By the way, the fact that we can do six degrees of freedom of the chest and pelvis allows us to measure them independently of one another. So it's not just a fixed trunk, like when you see 2D and people draw a line straight down from the shoulder to the hip and they look at your tilt axis. Sure, we can do that as well, but we can also measure the chest and the pelvis independently so we can get there separate motions and that allows us to get spine uh, motion as well. Um, so we can get bend, chest bend, we can get the trail knee and lead knee and the lead elbow and the trail elbow. Um, we can also do pelvis sway, chest sway, knee sway, trail knee sway, um, lift. Lift is really interesting because that's a good one in our speed report. It tells us how much uh, or helps tell us how much you're generating speed. So chest lift and pelvis lift. And then the kinematic sequence, which is huge. I've done a lot of work, you may know, in the kinematic sequence over the past uh, 20 or so years. And having this as one of the parameters that we can measure is very exciting. Pelvis chest turn, pelvis and chest turn speeds, lead arm and club and uh, the shaft actually, swing speeds, speed gains across the joints, gain factors, how much you increase the, the, the speed up the chain from the pelvis to the chest, to the arm, to the club, and then linear speeds of the mid hands and the club head. And I want to emphasize that we do measure the club. So that's very cool as far as getting wrist angle and shaft face angle, uh, face on angle. And uh, of course, in the golf swing, the club is very important. So measuring what the club does is, is a big advantage for us. Now, being a very visual um, application, we have a, an avatar which provides us six primary views from the front, from the back, from the top, from the bottom, um, et cetera. And these different perspectives allow you to see uh, things that you wouldn't normally see in 2D. 
you might have taken a specific angle with 2D and you can't change that angle. Whereas with the avatar, we can rotate the avatar basically to any uh, any viewpoint that we want. And that's very important when you're trying to uh, show your student a specific um, perspective and specific fault or specific aspect that you're trying to talk about uh, in the swing. So having those primary views is really uh, a good deal. Um, now I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan and he's gonna talk about best practices, capture requirements, and uh, what not to do, basically what to do and what not to do. So, all right, Ryan, you're up. Thanks, Phil. You can move to that next slide for me, please. I will take care of the slides for you. Cool. So what we're gonna be obviously presenting on today is, is showing you know some accuracy data and all the hard work that Dr. Phil Cheatham and Nate Ashton have done on our team. And like I said, accuracy is something that we are really, really proud of. It's also something that we are constantly getting better at. And I hope everybody leaves today's webinar, you know, really seeing, you know, how much we do care about accuracy within Sportsbox. Now, a big part of making sure that you're getting good data is making sure that you're getting good captures. And so if anybody's had a you know one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, they've asked me questions, this is something that I've been preaching from the start. This is going to be very, very important. If you're not getting good captures, you're probably potentially increasing the risk of then getting some data that might not be uh, fully accurate, which that's just a recording issue. That's not actually anything to do with the numbers that we could get you. So first things first, we need to make sure that you are recording the player's height and inside the app, we automatically calculate the hip width based on that. So if you're a coach and you're recording something inside the app for just yourself and the person standing in front of you that you're truly recording isn't the same height as you, that could change some of the data that you would be getting within the app. So this is one of the big reasons why it's really important for us to make sure that we're creating those student accounts. That way we have that person's specific height. We'll calculate that hip width for them. And then from there, that's going to obviously ensure that you're going to be getting some good numbers as well. Now, the other big thing that's important is we need to make sure that the player and the club are visible through the entirety of the golf swing. If the person in front of you is swinging and part of the body gets cut out or part of the club gets cut out, that could again, throw off some of the numbers that you're getting. So you always want to make sure that from standard zoom, you're roughly seven to 10 feet away. Honestly, just depending on the person's height that's in front of you, you know, the taller the person, the further back you're going to have to stand. If they're a little bit shorter, like you're working with a junior player, you could be able to get a little bit closer in their swing. Now, some people don't have seven to 10 feet away. We do have half zoom inside of the app where you could then be roughly three to six feet away too. Another big part of this, making sure that you're getting good data is also making sure that the camera is still. So this is why we always suggest using a tripod. When you use that tripod, it's gonna help the camera not move. And when you have a video that's a little shaky, that's gonna lead to some shaky data as well. And then lastly, you wanna make sure that the recording is at the correct height itself. So we always suggest that it's at belly button to, weight, uh, to waist high, somewhere around there, even hands high to belly button high, you know, is ultimately going to give you really good captures. That's the other thing that I notice with a lot of coaches is they'll kind of just be standing up and recording from your sternum. So you're then recording a little bit too high on the player as well. So in order for us to get you as accurate of information as we can, we want to make sure that you're kind of following these requirements. The player, we need to be able to record their height inside the app. We want to make sure that we can see the player in the golf club through the entirety of the golf swing. We want to make sure that the camera is nice and still when doing that recording and that the camera is anywhere from hand high to belly button height. If you're recording at somebody's sternum or if you're at their headline, you know, again, that is going to be too high from a recording level. These are just some good examples of what good captures look like. So 
Here you can see the lighting for all of these is going to be good. You're also going to see that the camera height itself is good, and I'm right kind of in the midline of each of the players' bodies here. The next slide is going to show you some bad examples. So here you're going to see that first person is going to be a little bit dark. We can barely see them in the frame. The person in the middle is going to be kind of off camera. And then the third person is going to be too close. And you can even see how the shaft of the golf club is a little bit blurry. So the brightness level here was actually a little too bright, which would then you know, make it so that the shaft itself starts to blur. Something that's really important for coaches is to understand how would these different environments influence some of the numbers. So, so there are some times where you're not going to be able to get a perfect capture. Now, most of the time you're going to be able to get really, really good captures, but sometimes you might be in an environment where the shaft of the golf club gets a little blurry. And so for you, the coach, to understand how that can impact some of the data is going to be helpful because then you can look at the numbers and have trust in the numbers that you know are still going to be good compared to, hey, you know, when the club itself gets a little bit blurry, this could then provide a unique number um, that we wouldn't really suggest. And this is something that we point out inside the app to coaches when we um, when you go to import a video. It'll say like club head speed may not be available. A big part of that is because a lot of times when players or coaches are importing a video itself, that'll make it where the shaft is a little bit too bright because they recorded with a little bit too much light in general. So when the camera is shaking, so if you're a coach that's recording just by your hand and the camera is shaking, you're going to notice that the linear numbers could potentially be picking up some of that shaking. So your sways, your lift, your thrust. So you're going to want to make sure that it's on a tripod. Otherwise, those numbers are the ones that would be predominantly influenced. If you're in a low lighting situation, again, that's going to blur the shaft of the golf club potentially when we increase the brightness for you to record from. And that would make it where potentially that club head speed, maybe some of the shaft data um, isn't exactly where we would want it to be as well. Uh, the same thing with like when a player is too close, um, you know, we're then kind of guessing where the golf club is going to be at if that's being cut out through the entirety of the swing. Same thing with like a player's body. If it's getting cut out, the AI is taking some assumptions there. So when you are in those poor environments, just be aware of how it could potentially impact some of the numbers. A lot of the data is still probably going to be very good for the most part. Um, looking at like your turn numbers itself, as long as the camera is nice and still, even in low lighting, those turn numbers are going to be great too. So it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get, you know, bad numbers when you're in these environments. It just increases the risk of getting a number that maybe looks a little different to you. And that's part of technology. Everybody uses technology within teaching, and I think everybody knows launch monitors pretty well nowadays. And sometimes when we're looking at some launch monitor data, you might see a number that's like, ah, that one doesn't look to be correct. Um, and usually we just take another capture and we don't pay too much attention to it. And that's really just all technology that's out there. Yeah, but just one other point that I, uh, before I get into my next session, I just want to re-emphasize the fact that you need to be square on, face on. I think you already mentioned it, that we want to be like belt buckle high or thereabouts, but we also want to be dead in front and you want to make the camera as square to the golfer as possible. Um, and don't be off like to the side 20, 30 degrees or too high, as you mentioned earlier. So those are very important factors as well. And like you want, you can see in the middle there, you don't want to be off to the side. Try and Put the golfer right in the middle and be as square on as possible. Okay, we'll talk about trusting the data now, and, and we'll get into the nitty gritty of the accuracy aspect. Um, the way I look at uh, trusting the data, I look at several different levels. So for example, the first thing I look at is what I call a sanity check. Does the avatar match the video? And I've got example slides, I'll show you in a minute, but I'll go over my, my thoughts a little bit first. Um, so yeah, does the when you overlay the avatar on the video, do they move and do they match? So we'll look at that in a minute. Functional accuracy. 
Um, I think of that as quality of the motion that we're capturing. Does the data show the expected motion characteristics? Uh, then you've got st what, what I'm calling standard accuracy or the quantitative value. How closely does the data match the so-called real values or those of the gold standard? Um, I want to point out now that what is the real gold standard? Well, we use um, the, elect uh, the electromagnetic system from AMM uh, as our gold standard. But I want to point out that whether it's an electromagnetic system or whether it's an optical system, whether it's got two cameras or 10 cameras, doesn't make any difference. It's going to have some errors. And those errors come from the way that you set up, the way you set up the cameras, the way you set up the golfer, how you place the markers or the sensors onto the, the golfer. And then, of course, once you put the markers and sensors on, do they move? their skin motion, or did the straps slip in the AMM system, or did the markers move in the gear system? They certainly do wobble on the surface, which creates uh, quite a bit of noise. The other point that you have to remember too is when you measure motion in 3D, there's many ways to measure it, especially angles. So you gotta make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and make sure that the algorithm that, uh, that computes the forward bend or the side bend or the turn are in fact the same algorithms because if they're different algorithms, they can cause different errors. So uh, in order for us to match perfectly to either AMM or whatever you're comparing us to, um, you have to actually match their errors because we're gonna have different errors, they're gonna have different errors. So you're always gonna be off slightly. But anyway, we're gonna look at those numbers a little more deeply when uh, Nate gets into that. The other thing we're gonna talk about is consistency. Um, if you measure multiple swings of the same golfer and say they're a really, really accomplished golfer, then you would expect their measurements to be very, very similar from one swing to another. And uh, we'll give you some numbers on that to show how consistent we are from swing to swing because we have done a study on that. So, uh, okay, where the heck is my video? Oh, that's interesting, it just faded in. Anyway, let's go ahead and, and play the video. Or I'll try again. Hmm. I apologize, for some reason my video is not playing. It must've been when I was copying slides from one to another. But uh, we can show that again later. Maybe during question time, I'll find find the video for you, um, showing how the avatar overlays directly on to the video in the background. Okay, moving on. So the next thing I want to talk about is what we called functional accuracy. And functional accuracy, as I said, is do the curves match the motion that we expect to see? For example, in chest turn, do we see the fact that the chest turns into the downswing before the top of backswing? Um, do we see a little blip here in the curve or a little deviation in the curve that is evidence of the deceleration uh, from the kinematic sequence? Um, when we're looking at chest bend, do we see that it's more vertical at the top and that the chest is going upright uh, during the downswing and the follow through um, due to the the centrifugal force of the club pulling on the golfer. Um, chest side bend, we see increasing side bend in the downswing, and we'd better be seeing the maximum side bend after impact. Uh, that's 99% of the time, that's the way that happens. So these are characteristics that we understand we see in a golf swing. Um, lead to trail side bend action. Is it lead side bend on the backswing? And trail side bend, it turns into trail side bend in the downswing and follow through. So these are all things that we expect to see. And you can see that the blue curve is sports box and the green curve is AMM and they're tracking very, very closely. Let's look at uh, shaft now. Let's look at the club and the lead wrist. We can see the lead shaft angle face on and they're almost identical directly on top of one another, just a few degrees here and there. The other thing with the lead wrist angle is, yeah, they don't match perfectly, 
but we're looking at just a few degrees here and there. The thing that's very important is, do we see the downswing loading of this golfer? This curve going down and then rapidly going up again, that shows us the release point. And do they coincide? So you can see the blue and the green are pretty darn close to one another. So we do get the nice lead risk profile and train, tra um, lead risk profile of the different styles, whether it be casting or whether it be downswing loading. Now we've got uh, club head speed and mid hand speed. We see that they match again pretty close. Yeah, there's a few wobbles here and there, but they're only a few degrees. And you can see that the peaks match really well and the timing of the peaks match really well. One thing I do want to point out is you see the green one here vibrating slightly. And that's uh, due to the fact that the AMM is an electromagnetic system and it's very sensitive to the vibration of the club handle. And that's because there's a sensor on the handle. So optical systems don't see that vibration quite as much. And that's typical with whether it's a, it's a Vicon or a Gears or a, a Qualysys, doesn't matter. The optical systems tend to smooth that out a little bit because they usually use what's called digital filtering. Okay, so that's a little bit about functional accuracy and uh, a sanity check. And now I'll hand it back over. I'll hand it to Nate and he'll get into some of the numbers and talk about our data collection processes. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the data collection process, as Phil just said, and we'll actually finish with looking at some numbers uh, directly from Sportsbox in comparison to AMM uh, for swings. So, you know, starting off with a little bit of information about data collection and testing. So we, when performing data collection sessions, you know, for the purpose of testing accuracy or adding swings to our training with AMM, we like to treat the process like we're conducting a scientific study. So we have protocols we follow throughout the entire procedure. And if you kind of, if you look at the pictures on the right side of the screen there, the top one is actually looking at a, a screenshot or a picture that we took during a data collection session where we had sports box running from both face on and down the line point of view. And you have AMM being run as well. So AMM is the box that's just above the computer that you can see there. And Taylor from our team is uh, digitizing and setting somebody up into the AMM system. So I, I saw in the Q&A question about optimal recording angle for down the line as well. So I know Ryan uh, talked about, um, you know, position of face on. And so position for down the line, what we would like to recommend, and I'll kind of highlight this and what we go through in our data collection uh, process. We want to be as close as perpendicular to the player as you can be. Um, really what we end up looking for when we do our data collection sessions is we actually look at the target line with our phone and we are aimed roughly at the hands at the address position. Uh, so hopefully that answers at least that question within that. So, um, so kind of as we go through, um, you know, and we're doing data collection, we try to create a controlled environment to the best of our abilities to make sure that the data capture using AMM, sports box, we, multi we often capture with, you know, launch monitors all simultaneously, and we try to synchronize them as best as we possibly can. So this starts with, you know, thorough detail as to how we're setting up each of the systems. So we make sure that we have, uh, you know, properly trained individuals setting up AMM, if that comes to it, if we're especially going to use that data for accuracy testing. Uh, we want to make sure the data we're getting out of AMM as well as what we're getting out of sports box is you know compatible as much as possible. So um, you know when we're setting up sports box, we follow best recording practices again, like Ryan mentioned. Uh, we do this for both face on and down the line. So with the camera set up for down the line being more perpendicular to the player and with target with respect to the target line, uh, and face on being parallel to the AMM global coordinate sensor. So this is when we're collecting data between the two systems. Again, the global coordinate system uh, sensor, as Phil is highlighting there, that is where we're able to capture in AMM, you know, local coordinates where they're moving in time and space. So the golfer is calibrated to that global coordinate system. So when they move, we'll understand how much they turn with respect to that. So we try to make sure when we're setting up AMM, that, or sorry, when we're setting up Sportsbox, that we're trying to follow suit. And that way, when we compare the data, you know, we can say, hey, we're as close to this data as we possibly can be. So, you know, and a huge factor in performing accuracy, also like Phil said, in comparison and testing between systems is understanding, you know, each of the systems in the setup and their data output. 
So both AMM and Sportsbox, we use the same algorithms, which allow us to compare results you know, directly and to have further insight into accuracy or even errors, which is a big deal. So you know, collecting data is something that is honestly the easy part once you do the first initial setup. Um, but the real fun is comparing and understanding the output values. So we take accuracy testing very seriously when we're working to provide the best data and user experience possible. You know, our team spends many hours each week testing ways to improve you know, features in the app, you know, additions of new features, uh, most importantly, accuracy updates and, and or improvements where it's necessary. Uh, you know, this is the biggest thing when you're using a, a you know, markerless motion capture system. If the data you're getting isn't reliable enough, isn't accurate enough, um, then you know, it's kind of just a toy versus being a tool. So um, you know, trackers and indicators that we currently have in the app, you know, they have hit a standard of accuracy and consistency that we have set for ourselves. And you know, we have over a hundred more variables that are currently in testing and development, but if it doesn't meet our threshold in testing, it doesn't get released to, to you, to the user. You know, so for every new release build that gets published to the user, it's gone through extensive accuracy testing uh, to make sure that we're as good as we can get, you know, for you. Right, Phil, if you can go to the next. So before we get into some more numbers, um, I just want to kind of highlight and bring us back to, uh, you know, just a refresher out of, you know, what is mean and what is a standard deviation? Because we're going to talk about these. We're going to talk about mean or average, and we're going to talk about absolute average in some of our data that we're reporting. So, you know, let's start by looking at defining the mean or an average, right? So uh, a mean or an average is adding up all the numbers and divide by how many samples that you have. So we put together a, a table as an example here where we have three swings, if you will, from two different golfers, let's say. So you have set A and set B. So to calculate the average of the mean, we would then take swing one plus swing two plus swing three and divide by three. So for golfer A, we would get a mean or an average of 5.7. Golfer B, you get an average of 5.3 for whatever these units or variables are. If you look at the mean compared to one another, that looks like you have a difference of about 0.4, right? So when we then go into reporting accuracy and understanding um, the differences, true differences where they lie within systems, we like to look at what is the absolute mean or absolute average. So that is, yes, the far right side. What you do for this is actually take the absolute difference between, let's take swing one, which is five and seven. That's a difference, absolute difference of two. Right? We like to look at the absolute difference because if you look at the mean, if you have an error that is minus one and an error that is plus one, that average is zero. Right? So that can be slightly misleading versus if you take the absolute difference, minus one to one, that is one of an error. So when we look at absolute difference in this case, again, you'd go through and take the difference between the two sets, what was the absolute, and then take the average of that, which would give us a value of 1.7. So I think it's a little bit of a clear um, you know, number to understand exactly where those differences may lie between systems or sets of data. Another way of looking at that for absolute mean or error, you know, think of an archery target, for example. If you, you know, hit a shot right in the dead center, that's worth 10 points. If you then hit a shot uh, to the outside of that next ring, and let's say it's to the top of the 10 point and you have one to the bottom of the 10 point, either way, the next ring is worth eight, right? So that's a good way to look at absolute difference. Now I wanna kind of highlight, again, bringing in what is standard deviation? So we also use the standard deviation to help report data when it comes to accuracy that looks at you know, the amount of variance within a set of numbers. So how what you can look at in this case, if we're looking at the graphs there, would be how you know, spread out or how tight is a cluster around the mean. So if you see uh, the one on the left that Phil's highlighting, that's a small standard deviation. You see the peak is very high. Uh, the blue, if that's what we're focusing on within the standard deviation, is smaller. And if you look at the uh, graph on the right side, we have a large standard deviation that's spread out a big bell curve where, again, the blue section is typically plus or minus one standard deviation. That's gonna be a lot larger of a number. So 
if you then go down and kind of look at the bottom graph there that Phil has, you know, to create uh, a range, this is actually where it's important to understand the mean or the average as well as the standard deviation. For a typical data set, you know, plus or minus one standard deviation will encompass roughly 70% of the data. So that's what you like to look at to understand. So if we take the average and you subtract the mean or the standard deviation and add the standard deviation, that gives you a defined range. And that's also what we do when we provide information within the app for you to compare against. Okay. So you can go to the next one, Phil. Yeah, so before I do that, Nate, let me just answer a question that was posed uh, quickly, and I wanted to answer it live. And that is, are Gears and AMM different from each other? Yes, they are different from each other. I did mention in my trusting the data slide that optical systems um, and electromagnetic systems differ in the way they capture data and, and can have different types of errors. Doesn't necessarily mean one is right or wrong. It means they're different. They measure in different ways. And so I, I just want to point that out that uh, we're not casting aspirations on any of the systems that are out there. Um, they're different. Uh, and so recently, since there's been so many more markerless systems, they're starting to look at accuracy in a different way. And they're starting to compare and contrast rather than making sure or, or calling one an absolute gold standard. There is no absolute gold standard. I mean, literally, you'd have to drill uh, spikes into the bones to capture the real motion of the human. And obviously, we're not, not going to do that. So we are doing the best we can with the tools that we have. All right, Nate, let's move on. OK. Yeah, so let's let's get into some of the actual accuracy numbers. The, as you're seeing in this slide, this is actually a report directly from data uh, that we have a table created that's absolute average differences between sports box and AMM at key positions. It, we threw up some data here. Again, we have a plethora of data, but we want to make it where you can actually be able to read it and, and see what these values look like. So the data shown here uh, in the table on the right-hand side is from a sample size of 30 golf swings. And this data set contains seven iron and driver swings, male, female, golfers from a you know, casual level all the way to a professional level, and we have indoor and outdoor swings all put together. You know, qualifying requirements for these swings were that they were recorded you know, following the best practices for capture. So as we went through and did sports box and AMM data collections together, we just made sure that the videos uh, had the club in frame the entire swing and that there was no club head blurriness. So the first column in the table is actually looking at the defined trackers uh, that we have here. So we're presenting the chest and pelvis turn, chest and pelvis side bend, and chest bend, or forward bend in this case. And then we have chest sway and pelvis sway, and chest lift and pelvis lift. And for each of the respective trackers, we're showing the absolute average difference at address, top, and impact. Uh, you can see for the linear measurements at the bottom that address has dashes. Uh, that's as both AMM and Sportsbox measure linear movement with respect to the address position. So let's look at the top of the table here. You know, focusing on that, uh, on the angular measurement section, you know, on average, Sportsbox differed from AMM by roughly two degrees across the three positions. And if you focus on chest turn and chest bend, they trended slightly higher in Sportsbox for those absolute differences. Uh, if we went back and looked at it outside of absolute. And if we looked at pelvis turn, chest side, chest and pelvis side bend, uh, they trended slightly lower compared to AMM within these values. And then if we move down to the bottom portion of that table, uh, focusing on then the difference between sports box and AMM, where you can see for linear measurements, we're within about half an inch at top and impact for the linear linear movement. Okay, Phil, thank you. Yeah, so next we have club head speed comparison of sports box and foresight. Uh, you know, we had for uh, we've had club head speed in, and we've made some improvements on how we calculate and how we handle club head speed. Uh, so it's exciting to always look at large data sets to report 
you know, how we compare. So our sample size in this set was a comparison of actually 480 golf swings that range from club head speeds of 80 miles per hour to 124 miles per hour. You know, this data captured for this analysis was performed really as any golf coach with a launch monitor would set up a coaching session where you have, a, a, in this case, a foresight running, you know, a person hitting golf balls and sports box and the optimal setup recording the swings. So the, you know, so now let's look at the table a little bit. You know, the first row of the table, we can see the mean or average for uh, foresight and sports box. And remember the mean is adding up all of the speed values in this case and dividing by the number of sample size. We see the average for foresight was 104 miles per hour and the same swings captured on sports box were 104, or 100, yeah, 104.3 miles per hour. Yeah, the second row of this uh, shows both foresight and sports box having similar uh, distribution trends within both sets of their data, you know, with respective uh, standard deviations being 8.7 and 8.9. You know, looking at the last cell on the right of this table, this is where we have the average absolute value. We took the absolute difference between sports box and foresight for every single swing and then took the average of those numbers. Sportsbox trended to be slightly faster than Foresight on average. But you know, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, especially if you're comparing a track band even to a Foresight, you know, they can be roughly two to three miles per hour different as well. And this could come from differences within recording styles, uh, you know, kind of similar to motion capture systems, as Phil said. Uh, you know, Foresight uses reflective markers on the face and track band measures from behind, and Sportsbox is taking a video from face on. All right, Phil, go to the next one. So this is a table, uh, this is a slide um, that we're really excited to, to show and be able to talk about from doing some sample testing and, and data captures with some golfers. And this is looking at consistency and variability now. You know, so we covered the differences between, you know, sports box and multiple systems before. But again, understanding the consistency and variability when you're looking between Sportsbox and AMM, uh, you know, that's the exciting thing for us. So each of these tables, we have you know, chest turn at top, we have chest turn at impact, pelvis sway at top, and pelvis sway at impact. They show the average and the standard deviation for both Sportsbox and AMM respectively. So for this test, we wanted to understand you know, the standard deviation differences between the two systems. Okay, so this is kind of testing, you know, again, are you consistent variable, very, have the correct variability between both sets when looking at data sets of swings. So from this, we have three sets of golfers, of golfer data. We have golfer A, golfer B, and golfer C for each of the variables. And these were professional level players, uh, kind of similar to what Phil said, when you look at standard deviations, it, you would typically would see a smaller standard deviation when it comes to players with higher ability uh, versus those of maybe lower ability because they're able to reproduce that movement consistently. So each of this, uh, each of these golfers data sets, um, they took 10 swings with a six iron and we processed all 10 swings. Uh, we did not exclude any from that set as again, the recordings from Sportsbox in this case were to us optimal. Uh, so we created the averages and standard deviations per person. So looking at the first table for chest turn at top, it, we see the standard deviation for golfer A on sports box was 1.5 degrees. And for AMM, it was 1.1 degrees for the same swings. You know, this tells us one for seven uh, out of the 10 swings for this golfer, they only varied by about one degree of turn uh, at top. You know, both systems were measuring with almost the same amount of variability from swing to swing. So if you look, you know, more expansive across the data on this slide itself, it, you can see that the standard deviations for both systems are very close. So, you know, that's what was most exciting when we were able to do this study of taking multiple uh, individual players and looking to see how they performed intro related. So, you know, this tells us, you know, from swing to swing within one golfer, Sportsbox is able to measure the movement changes and variability accurately. And as, as Phil stated, you know, from the first step, as we go through sanity check, you know, do we show a quality of movement pattern with functional accuracy? Next is the quantitative or numerical accuracy. 
and consistency. And sports box is both. Uh, that's what's so exciting about being able to look at this. We done? Yeah, and then I think from here, I'll turn it back to Sorry, Nate, you're, you're uh, cutting out. Turn it over to Ryan here if you guys were able to hear what I finished yeah. with. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> so as you guys can see, I mean, just based on everything that Nate just presented and Dr. Phil Cheatham, you can see that the data itself is really, really good. And so from a coaching perspective, I think it's important for us to kind of keep a few things in mind. Obviously, you just saw that the data itself is really good, but also we need to think of 3D as a tool for our players. And the reason that 3D is a tool for our players is it's going to help them understand what it is that we're communicating to those players. And so when we're able to record 10, 15 swings and just get consistent data, that's going to help the player first understand what it is that we want to actually change. And then also for them to be able to see the progress along the way. So it's going to be easier to track. And one of my favorite things is it helps them quantify real versus feel. So when they're on the lesson tee with us, you can actually record a swing of them exaggerating what it is that you're asking and they can see, you know, what did that lead to? So this is an incredible tool for everyone to use. The other big thing is we as a coach still need to use our judgment, just like we use our judgment when using other technology like TrackMan, like, you know, all the different launch monitors out there. There's some times where you might look at a piece of data and think, eh, that's maybe a little bit off. It's just going to happen with technology at time to time. Let's make sure that we're getting good captures because that's most likely going to be the leading cause to some of that data. Uh, and again, no technology is 100% accurate, uh, as we've seen with those various launch monitors that are out there nowadays. And a lot of coaches are, you know, they really want 3D data to be perfect. And honestly, we don't know what perfect is. As Dr. Phil Cheatham said, you would have to drill you know, into the bones to be able to actually measure, you know, what is happening there. And so you can see clearly through the data that we shared comparing to AMM that we are going to be accurate. And so if a coach is choosing to use 2D over using 3D, there are going to be some challenges there too. So I just kind of want to highlight, um, you know, from a 2D perspective, how we can be misled a little bit. So Phil, you can go to the next slide. You can see I just drew a classic, you know, line going down the trail hip here of all these players and all these players are going to be right inside of that line. But when we actually go and show their sway data here, you're going to notice that there's actually a wide variety um, that they're going to be at. So, Phil, you can move to the next slide here and you'll be able to see that Hideki all the way on the left, his pelvis sway is negative 2.4 inches. And then you could see Max Homa is negative 0.7. This LPGA Tour player is at 0.4. And then John Rahm is at 1.1. So for us coaches, if we're relying on 2D data and relying on just looking at these lines that we've been drawing, you can see maybe it's not the most accurate way to be able to help a player out. And I think it's also important for us to remember that our players don't have nearly as much experience and time at looking at these lines. And so what may look, you know, pretty obvious to us as a coach, since we've, you know, drawn so many 2D lines before, it might mean absolutely nothing to a player. But when you can actually give them a measurement, that is going to make it easier for them to be able to understand what it is that we're talking about. You can go to that last slide there, Phil. And I'm going to keep this one, you know, just short. That way we can get to some questions here. Um must have replayed that one. Let's see. No, it looks like it like, duplicated that last slide. But just some things to uh, understand, you know, with Sportsbox itself is, you know, our system is $800 a year. So you have this advantage of not having to invest a ton of money into these different 3D softwares and, and analysis tools. You're able to get it right there on your phone. There's 
you know, instant access to sports box. You don't have to wait for anything to be sent to you. So that's a huge benefit to coaches when you're using sports box is just the actual cost of it. And I think the other thing that's really important for us to understand too, is that you can get 3d data from anywhere. And so other 3d systems I've owned three different systems and all of them pretty much had to be more in an indoor setting where golf is not played from indoors. We are played out on the golf course and there's all sorts of different, you know, variability that's going to be out there. It's amazing that now we can actually get 3D data, you know, out on the golf course itself. And like I said, there's zero setup time. So in any lesson, you could get 3D data if you wanted, where before using some of these other systems, unfortunately, it just takes time to set up. And if you're not setting up those systems correctly, Again, that could also lead to some poor data. So if you're rushing through the setup or if a marker ends up slipping, unfortunately, that could produce some data that would obviously maybe arise a question in your head there too. So uh, the last piece that I think is really, really beneficial to us coaches is a player is able to get a capture inside Sportsbox themselves. And myself, the coach, can look at it wherever I am in the world. So they don't have to be with me. They're able to actually get a capture. I can go and look at it and be able to provide them, you know, that information off of actual data itself. So before those people would have to come to us, we'd have to get them all hooked up. Now you don't need to do that. I could have a player in California send me a swing and now I can actually use 3D data on their golf swing. So these are some things to kind of think about as a coach you know, just the benefits of using a markerless system. You saw how accurate the data is, but there's also the cost side of it and how much you can actually use it. You're going to get so much out of the app itself because you can get captures in every single lesson. And, and there's none of that, um, you know, setup time that we've had to battle before and other issues that come with a censored system. Let's kick it off to those questions. So, uh, Ryan, before we do, I'd like to introduce two of our advisory board members, Dr. Jeff Broker and Dr. Mike Duffy. Uh, we had a session last week where we were doing prep for this uh, presentation, and we showed the uh, numbers that you've just seen to Dr. Broker and Dr. Duffy, and uh, they were very pleased with what they saw. So, so Jeff or Mike, do you want to chime in and, and make a quick statement? I do want to say that uh, Jeff, what happened there? Did it, it went away? Yeah. So I, I don't need to share my screen anymore. I guess I'll take my screen share off. So yeah, Jeff uh, just got a um, acknowledgement that his paper that he submitted to the World Scientific Congress of Golf using Sportsbox to capture data was accepted. So we're very, very excited about that. So Jeff, are you there? Do you want to give a, a little bit of a, a background? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can, can you hear me okay, Phil? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing me in here. Uh, it, it's it's pretty uh, clear based on what uh, Phil and Nate and Ryan have described as the, um, the power uh, of being able to collect data in the field in real golf settings, and that's what I'm doing. I, you know, I've been a biomechanist since uh, I hate to date myself, but back into the late '80s, and worked at the Olympic Training Center, and and came up through the ranks of biomechanists using uh, film at one point, uh, and then crude video, and then multi-camera systems, uh, peak systems, and qualysis systems. Uh, and then I and then I had an AMM system worked worked with that uh, for several years. I still have that, um, and um, always in a laboratory setting, or um, at best a swing bay, but still constrained. Um, you know, subjects are not swinging like they do on the course. They don't get their pre-shot routine. Uh, sometimes they don't even use a waggle. They may not be comfortable with the equipment, uh, and so. So I've uh, joined this team to sort of uh, stretch its limits and see if I can use the the capture system and the analysis system to get out of the out of the laboratory, out of the swing bay, and actually measure golfers on the in in play. And that, that's what I'm what I've been doing. Um, as I'm doing it, I had the same um, 
questions for years, uh, it, it joining this group and looking at the, the system guide, the question about accuracy. And uh, I've got numbers. I'm looking at players swinging, swinging uh, clubs on par threes during the competition and looking at swing mechanics changes across uh, across the multiple swings, three swings in a, in a round of golf. Um, I've done work on the range, uh, looking at multiple swings on the range and comparing that to work on the course. And uh, I want I want to have confidence that the data is accurate so that I can make estimations and conclusions about the changes I'm seeing. So I'm extremely excited. Uh, uh, I came away from our meeting looking at these latest accuracy numbers and uh, consistent, consistency numbers. Um, extremely pleased, uh, feeling really good about my data and, and some of the studies I have planned going forward. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. And uh, congratulations on getting your paper accepted. That's very cool. Feather in your cap. Uh, Dr. Duffy, have you got anything you'd like to comment? Are you still around? Uh, Mike might have might have left. Okay. All right, Ryan, let's pass it back over to you. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to be actually before we ask answer questions, I just want to do a quick summary. The things we talked about were pretty extensive, and this is the first time we've actually published some of our accuracy numbers. So we're pleased to do that. And uh, obviously, we're happy to hear your comments and questions. But we do want to talk uh, emphasize that um, there is no real absolute standard to measure to anymore. I mean, in the past, we've measured to the multi-camera systems, the Vicons and the Qualysys and the Motion Analysis Corporations and so on. And they show really good static accuracy. But of course, every system has to measure the human body. And as soon as you put markers on, as soon as you start measuring the human body, things change. So now these days, it's more of a comparison. Do they measure similarly? Um, are they consistent? And I think we've We've explained that quite a bit to, to today. The other thing is we track more than just the 18 points. We track uh, 35, 36, 37, depending on which of the, the models we're using. And we are able to track six degrees of freedom in a similar manner to what AMM was doing. And so we feel that we're very powerful in that respect. Um, let, it, let me see. I'm just thinking... Uh, yeah, I think that that uh, Ryan has made a really good point that please um, observe the best practices so that you get the best capture. And as he said, if, if occasionally things look a little bit awry, then set up your camera again and do another capture. But I think that that's a good sum summary of what we've talked about today. We're very pleased with the way things are going. And as Nate suggested, we are very fastidious in measuring the accuracy of each of our new releases. So with that being said, uh, Ryan, I'll hand it over to you to handle some of the questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff has got his hand up for one more comment. Go ahead, Jeff. I don't think Ryan mentioned this. This is something I've experienced. Uh, if you're working in a swing bay or a laboratory like I do, and you have a black background, uh, don't have your golfers wear black shirts. <laughs> um, there's contrast issues, and and that can even occur in a very light background uh, outdoors with a light shirt. So um, even the selection of clothing can maximize the accuracy of the collection. Yes, and and I think that uh, it's four o'clock, but I'd like to just spend a little bit of time answering questions. So if you'll permit us, we'll go a few minutes over. Off you go, Ryan. All right, let's dive into these questions. So, so Craig Foster is wondering, will it be possible in the future to measure the radial ulnar joints in the forearms? Will there eventually be a putting application as well? So can I answer the first one? I think what you're referring to is basically the, the supination pronation and the flexion extension and the radial ulnar deviation of the forearm and the wrist. I think that uh, we're progressing towards that, but as you can imagine, certain things are very difficult to see on uh, video. However, there are ways that we can look at the angle between the shaft and the, the arms and be able to come close to some of those uh, 
actual angles. Currently, we do measure the wrist angle, and the wrist angle that we measure, you could think of that as a true, um, what's the way to say it? It's a, it's a 2D angle, but it actually follows the body. So imagine that you laid a piece of cardboard on the on the forearm and the shaft of the club, and then you drew those two lines and then you measured the angle between them. And that that follows the way that the arm is moving. So we're very accurate in measuring the wrist angle from that point of view, but getting the six degrees, uh, sorry, the three degrees of freedom of the wrist, uh, that's for the future. And then putting was the next question. Yeah, and with putting, that's something that we want to do. Um, with the putting stroke, that's a little bit different than an actual, you know, golf swing. So that's something that would uh, need some training from an AI to be able to actually capture and then also understand, you know, what number and data do coaches want. So it's not something in the near future, but it's definitely something that we have on the the roadmap to, you know, want to bring out to to the coaches. All right, let's see what other questions we have. So Neil asked a question, do you need internet connection to capture a swing or can you do it without internet? I can answer that one. Uh, you can do it without internet. The only thing that you need the internet for is just logging in. Uh, if you are logged out of the app itself uh, or if you want the swing itself to upload to the cloud. So if you are off the internet, just make sure at the end of the day that you go onto the internet, that'll then trigger an upload for your videos to go to the cloud. That way you don't lose them in the future. Tony asked a question. He's seen some strange tempo numbers like four to one. Any thoughts? Phil, do you want to talk about tempo a little bit and how we go to a decimal since some coaches aren't used to that? Yeah, with uh, with tempo, a four to one is not surprising. I just did an analysis of a hundred tour pros and I went, I found that they ranged anything from about a 2.7 up to about a 4.7. So depending on whether you got a slow backswing or and a fast downswing. And also it depends on the length of your swing too. If you've got a shorter backswing, it's going to have a much shorter downswing time and that's going to change your tempo. So we've been, we've been playing with tempo quite a bit recently. Can you define how we do tempo as well? Just so coaches. Well, yeah, tempo is, tempo is the, the backswing time divided by the downswing time. So the time from address to top of backswing, from top of backswing to impact. And those two numbers are divided and it's about three to one. Uh, our database average is 3.2 to one. So uh, it's it's about the three to one, as I say. The top of the backswing, by the way, I just noticed a quick question there. How do we define that? The top of backswing is defined as when the club turns around from backswing to downswing. So I that is to say, the club reaches its slowest speed. There are a lot of golfers that don't actually stop at the back, top of backswing. So we've defined it as when it reaches its slowest speed at the top. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, uh, just to jump in there too. Yeah. That, that could potentially affect what you might see from other calculations, depending on how you're doing it. Right. That's another definition of different algorithm or different approach. So if we're looking at that, um, that, that could potentially change what it is if you have longer backswing because we identified top a little bit later or a little bit earlier even. All right. Let's see. Mike Shy is wanting us to explain the gain numbers a little bit. All right. You want me to jump in and do that? Um, yeah, you can jump in. Oh. oh, you want to do that? Go ahead. Can. Oh, Doesn't okay. Matter. All right. So yeah, the gain numbers come from the kinematic sequence. They come from the peak speeds or the maximum speeds of each body segment as they're turning into the downswing. So in the kinematic sequence, your pelvis will turn, accelerate and decelerate, so speed up and slow down. And then the same will happen with your chest, the same will happen with your lead arm, and the same will happen with your club. So we have, a, in the downswing, we have a maximum turning speed of each one of those four body segments, pelvis, chest, arm, and shaft. And the speed gain, is how much increase in speed you got from the pelvis to the chest. So if your che your your pelvis was 500 and your uh, chest was 800 degrees per second, then they're rotational, so they're measured in degrees per second. Um, that so 500 for pelvis, 800 for chest, 
your speed gain would be 300 degrees per second. So it's the differential and it's the speed gained across the joint. Yeah, and to add on to that, you know, you can also then go to a gain factor, which that would then be a ratio between those. So that's how we can define also, um, you know, more applicable ratios that might be between a, a professional to even a, you know, a 15 handicap, if you want, you know, they could have same factors, but then that's when you look at the absolute differences gain uh, numbers, that, that's where you might see a lot of the differences, but. Yeah, that's like a smash factor for the body. So 500 for the pelvis, 800 for the chest. That would be eight over five, which would be 1.6. That would be the gain factor. Okay. Perfect. And then there is a question about what other sports we're doing. Uh, and if we have a timeline on when any other sports will be released. Do you want to talk about baseball, Phil? Yeah, well, we're working on the baseball swing first um, and then perhaps the pitch later. Um, but we're still in the development phase and we're testing at the moment. Uh, we've got some, some external customers that are beta testing for us. We're capturing um, data specifically so we can compare the databases of kids as they go through the stages um, of growth. And so that's going to be really interesting from the, uh, from the youth perspective. So it's going to probably be mid-year, something like that. We're already testing, but kind of in a closed group at the moment. Awesome. That's really exciting. I know a lot of coaches are going to be excited about that too. Corey was wondering how you share swings with students. As long as a student is in the account, so if you've created a student account for that player, uh, the swings will automatically be shared with them. So that's also one of the reasons why you want to create those student accounts. That way, your students are able to just open up the app and be able to see all the swings that you've captured for them. We also have a feature called goals in there. And so whatever it is that you're working on with a player, you could actually create a goal for them. So if I had a player and I was working on their turn at the top, I could set this is where I want you to turn to at the top, let's say between 85 and 95 degrees, then they on their app could actually see for their swings, were they inside that range or outside that range? Um, and so it's really great for them to know, did I do it right or wrong? And then also when they practice, there's this element where they could actually basically hit a shot and then check the data and see, am I in that range or outside that range? So the way I kind of think of goals is that it's like myself, the coach, is with my players 24-7. So it's a really, really great feature. If you're not using the goals feature or if you're not creating those student accounts, make sure that you are. You're going to love those. All right. We probably should think about wrapping it up. We're already nearly 10 minutes over. Um, awesome. The questions that, have, that we didn't answer, we'll try and get back to you on those um, as soon as we can. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. If you have any questions, feel free. You can always email me, and I'll make sure to get back to you with those answers. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.